Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege to be asked to deliver this memorial lecture. Uh, I, like our chairman tonight, uh, grew up in, in awe and admiration and delight at the Guinness Book of Records and the phenomenal memories uh, of the two people who we remember tonight in this lecture. And they created much joy and excitement and interest for small boys and bigger boys and girls as well. Uh, with their big Guinness Book of Records. It is also entirely fitting that tonight we should have one of those rare beings in our midst as our chairman, uh, a record breaker himself who qualified for the Guinness Book of Records. So I am uh, very much uh, honored by this request. Uh, I too respect the hugely important work uh, both McWorters did in the cause of freedom and in the cause of our wider country. And it's in that spirit that I would like to talk to you tonight. <coughs> I wish tonight uh, to talk about a country which is a European country, but which is not allowed to appear on the maps of Europe drawn up and designed by the European Union. I wish to talk to you uh, about a country which has played a very significant role worldwide uh, over historical time in developing crucial ideas of freedom, liberty, and democracy. A country which was a pioneer for the idea that everybody should be equal beneath the law, and a country that was a pioneer of the idea uh, that everyone should have a vote and should be able to get rid of government they did not like, or government that was not sufficiently accountable. I wish to speak to you tonight about a country which has made an extremely important contribution to the Union of the United Kingdom, uh, but a country whose name is scarcely ever mentioned on the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, which is meant to speak for that country as well as the other three in our Union, and is meant to provide service to us. I wish, ladies and gentlemen, to speak about my country, the country of many of you, I wish tonight to speak about England. I think it is time England had more voices. I think it is time that the English as well as the United Kingdom Parliament recognize the importance of England and recognize the need for England to, at times, have that distinctive voice and that ability to make up its own mind, which has been so characteristic of England uh, over the centuries as it's gone about its business of developing a democratic settlement. And I wish to speak about England uh, because I do think England both has contributed so much in the past and can contribute so much more. It is England which will help rebalance our damaged United Kingdom. It is England which has to tackle uh, with our friends in the rest of the United Kingdom the mighty problem of our relationship with the European Union. And more immediately, it is England which has to respond with good grace and great heart, but with common sense and democratic impulse uh, to the results of the Scottish vote on Scottish independence or devolution. Tonight, one of my main themes uh, will be uh, that we need a new settlement within the United Kingdom to deal with our inheritance of lopsided devolution. Labour rushed in the late 1990s to introduce a devolution settlement for Scotland and Wales in particular, uh, which was not well thought through, which they regarded as unfinished business, because you may remember the 1970s Labour government had put devolution proposals to Scotland uh, they had passed by a narrow majority, but not with sufficient consent. So in those days, it was thought necessary to have 40% of all those eligible to vote in support of major constitutional change. They failed to secure it. So when they returned to power after a long gap, at the end of the 1990s, uh, they decided to rush through a devolution settlement with which we are now dealing. And Labour wrongly told us at the end of the 1990s that their devolution settlement for Scotland would be an end of the matter. They felt that they had offered Scotland 
the right package. They felt that a limited amount of self-government for Scotland in that package would settle the Scottish issue, and they did not wish to know about the English issue, uh, phrased elegantly by one of their backbenchers as the so-called West Lothian question. The West Lothian question was a very simple question, like all really good questions that are difficult to answer. And it was, by what right would a Scottish MP come to the Westminster Parliament and vote through items for England when he or she had no power to vote through those same things for Scotland? And there was no answer to that under Labour's lopsided devolution settlement. And most of us in England said, well, we can live with it. The degree of self-government is limited. The devolved issues uh, are confined in number. And so we are happy, if Scotland is happy, that we should have lopsided devolution. If we now accept, as I do, that all three major parties wish to give Scotland tax-raising powers, assuming, as I do, that they will vote to stay in our union, in their forthcoming referendum, I don't think you can carry on with lopsided devolution in that way. I think the power to tax people is an even more extreme version of the power to govern them than some of the matters that are currently decided by devolved assemblies and parliaments. And so my reformulation of the West Lothian question tonight is this. Would English people, English Democrats, accept the idea that Scottish members of the Westminster Parliament could come to Westminster and create the majority to impose a tax rise or a tax on the English, which they could not impose on Scotland, especially if it was one tax rise or tax that the Scottish Parliament had no wish to impose on Scotland using their devolved tax powers. And I do not believe that that is an acceptable position to adopt. The essence of English liberties and then British and United Kingdom liberties revolved around controlling government. One of the most fundamental things to do to control government is to control their power to tax. And the history of English and then British democracy is in no small measure the wish of those who had to pay the taxes to first get redress of grievances, to first get laws that they like from their sovereign before granting the sovereign the money to carry out the conduct of government. That is the whole basis of representative parliamentary democracy in England and now in the United Kingdom. And it was summed up rather well by our American friends uh, who were part of our country until the War of Independence. Their slogan, you may remember, uh, when the British Parliament attempted to impose taxes on them, uh, which only they had to pay and over which they had no say, was the very effective slogan, no taxation without representation. How true that was, and that was already an important part of the English and British settlement, and it became a fundamental canon of the very successful American democratic settlement, and it is still surely today a crucial part of our democratic settlement. It lies behind the Constitutional Convention that only the House of Commons can pass money bills, because only the House of Commons is elected by the people, only we are accountable to the people, and the people must be able to get rid of the people who impose taxes upon them, fundamental to the proposition. But tonight, my argument on how to deal with lopsided devolution wishes to add to no taxation without representation the reverse of that very important proposition, uh, which is that there should be no representation without taxation. And that, I think, is going to be the fundamental issue that will lie behind productive discussions and debates on devolving tax matters to Scotland. That why should Scottish MPs have representational powers over English taxes when they and their constituents will not be paying them? 
I think it has to cut both ways. So for the sake of the cameras and the journalists, the, the simple message of this lecture is just that. Uh, that I strongly believe in our Anglo-Saxon democracy, that there should be no taxation without representation. But when we resettle our kingdom, uh, when we rebalance our devolution, we also have to have the reverse proposition that only those paying the taxes should vote and decide on those taxes. Only the representatives of those paying the taxes should make that decision because they must be accountable to those who have to pay the taxes. The story of England is really the story of the growth of freedom. And that's what makes English history um, pleasurable. Of course, like all countries, we've had our dark moments and our bad decisions and things that we wished had not happened. And we must always remember that the past is really a foreign country. Uh, although they are our ancestors, if you go back long enough, they had very different attitudes, very different approaches to life, and they had very different technology and very different capabilities. It is our privilege to live in the 21st century when there has been a taking off technology in a way which is so liberating and exciting and wonderful. So we need to approach the past circumspectly. But the one thing that we could always strike up a conversation about with our predecessors from the late medieval period, from the Tudor period, from the Stuart period, above all from the Stuart period, because they, they fought a, a dreadful war over these very issues, and from the Georgian and the Victorian period, would be the story of freedom. And they would understand exactly why freedom matters to us, because it matters to them. Uh, in the language of the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, we, in a way, uh, are dwarves on the shoulders of giants. We are as free as we are because of the heroic sacrifices made by all sorts of people in previous centuries to win those battles for freedom that were so important then and are still so important to us. Next year, our country will be rightly commemorating uh, 800 years from Magna Carta, 1215, at Runnymede. And that document has all sorts of things in it. Uh, like all historical documents, if you actually read the document or a translation of the document, it's often quite different from the simple descriptions that, that many people hold dear, because uh, it was peace treaty in its day, it was rapidly superseded and changed, uh, there were lots of things in it that were not eternal truths. But why I think it has survived so well, and why I will join in with all the others in rejoicing about its presence and about its legacy, is that it also had some fundamental eternal truths within it which have survived over those long centuries and have become even more important to our understanding and practice of democracy than in those early beginnings. The two most fundamental things uh, from Magna Carta for my story tonight are the idea that everybody is equal beneath the law, that everyone should have the right to a free trial and a, a jury judgment uh, by their uh, fellow free men. In those days, now free men and women, as we have uh, modernized in a sensible way. So we have that tradition with that very important forthright statement in Magna Carta that justice had to be blind, justice had to be available, justice had to be fair and free, and that the, the king, who had an important role in the government of the country, nonetheless should not be allowed to distort or take over justice. Very important strand from time to time Changes need to be made. The Stuart kings didn't always understand this, and so in 1641, the Star Chamber had to be abolished, as what had at times been a very effective way of offering uh, quick and good justice from the Crown, uh, was also prey to distortions in a way that Magna Carta uh, would not approve. And the second thing, which is eternal in Magna Carta, was the peace treaty clause which said that as they still couldn't really trust the king, 
uh, a group of elected barons would be established as a, a small steering group or committee uh, who would make sure that the king was playing the game and was implementing the, the treaty as agreed. And that is one of the embryo origins of Parliament. If you like, the barons who had to pay quite a bit of the tax were asserting that they wanted to address the grievances and reasonable justice and administration from the king and felt they needed some kind of advisory body or overseer. And of course, we go on through the centuries through Simon de Montfort's parliament to the peripatetic parliaments of the late medieval period to the, the battles between crown and parliament of the 16th and 17th centuries when uh, different kings prior to the Civil War uh, think they can get away with exercising more power, but when they need money, they have to turn to Parliament because it had been well established that Parliament had that right uh, to approve and raise the money in different ways from the English public. And so the Crown had to accept the need for Parliament to meet and as soon as Parliament met, Parliament would want new laws to deal with present abuses. Parliament would wish to express views on the, the conduct of the, um, the King's business. It's an interesting task giving a lecture. I see. <laughs> the, uh, the boat gently rolls. Yeah, I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, even if you have had too much to drink, that is not the cause of your, <laughs> your current feelings. I, I've had nothing alcoholic to drink, and I'm just detecting. We get a little bit of wash and roll as people go by. Uh, but it all helps to illustrate our, our seafaring past and present, I guess. And that is also part of our story, but not one go into detail on tonight. So we have in Magna Carta these two very important principles which start off these different strands of work, the independent courts, the independent judiciary, the, the right of redress, and the development of parliaments. And Parliament, of course, uh, has uh, various runs in with the Crown and decides in the 1640s that it really had to take to arms, uh, that the Stuart line had become too dogmatic, had wished to preempt far too much power, and that doughty Englishman's belief in an Englishman's liberties uh, carried them to victory against the crown and carried them to a totally new settlement. And then good old English compromise set in, because uh, we are not really radical, seething revolutionaries. We are evolutionaries. We are people who believe in good government proceeding by discussion and compromise as well as by a few guiding principles. So the restoration of the monarchy tries to mend the country, deeply divided between royalists and republicans, between parliamentarians and those in support of the crown. And the restoration of the crown with a new settlement creates a basis on which um, they could create an extremely successful state. But the other part of my story uh, to illustrate and define what we should do now in resettling our country is, of course, trying to define what our country is. And those of you who, who study history will know that our, our country has been through many changes. Uh, England has her own continuous story for about a thousand years or more of creating the liberties in the way I've been described. She was joined in this quest or endeavor, um, first by the Welsh. And the Welsh uh, joined us, most people would date, from 1485, when um, a man of some Welsh lineage, who became Henry VII, who was also a Lancastrian, uh, successfully bids for the crown, um, and the King lies dead on the battlefield and he takes the crown and goes to London in success. Makes limited moves to integrate Wales into England, uh, but that was clearly the direction of travel. And many of his Welsh supporters and advisors wanted to be in London and were well looked after as they got used to London as part of their bailiwick. But it was really his son, Henry VIII, uh, who decides that he wants a merged country. And so he puts through 
1536 to 1543, the Acts of Union with Wales, uh, which had been contentious ever since with Welsh nationalists, but which were a determined move by a sovereign who wished to govern England and Wales as one, wished to get rid of the march of lordships, uh, which caused all sorts of problems for the king's justice and for law and order, and create a smooth government across both countries with common justice, a common parliament, uh, and common taxation. And so from the, the mid-1530s, we have a new settlement where Wales becomes part of our combined story of England and Wales. Scotland partly joins us uh, in 1603 on the death of Elizabeth without heir. And she seemed to agree with it. Her courtiers certainly decided it was the only option and arranged that James VI of Scotland should also become James I of England. And although James, I think, would have liked to have amalgamated the two countries and would have liked it to have been a, a combined crown, it was two crowns and there were still two parliaments and two government systems. So there was Devo Max, if you like, uh, in the Great Britain that James wanted to create, but which constitutionally was difficult to achieve because of the uh, inbuilt loyalties of both the English and the Scottish governing classes uh, to their own parliaments and systems. There were various debates during the 17th century between England and Scotland over whether there should be a full union and the full union was finally achieved as the new century uh, dawned, and in 1707 we had the Act of Union. And the method there were, was very familiar to the method you would expect today, that the, both parliaments voted it through, and it needed the consent of both. England needed to vote through the Union of Scotland, accepting the, the terms and the liabilities as well as the advantages, and the Scottish Parliament voted for its own abolition or suspension, as the Scottish nationalists might say, uh, when it went into suspension for quite a, quite a long time, and joined Great Britain, uh, as we then became. But we don't become the United Kingdom for another century. Uh, the Irish problem had been extremely difficult. Uh, now is not the time or place to talk about that, uh, but suffice it to say, uh, that in 1800, finally, it was decided on both sides uh, that the two countries should be merged with a merger of their parliaments. Again, the parliamentary votes were held on both sides. And at the beginning of 1801, Ireland joins the, the Union with Great Britain, and we truly have a United Kingdom uh, of Great Britain and Ireland, or of England, Scotland, and Ireland with the Welsh Principality as also an important part of our Union. And from 1801 to 1921, we have 120 years of shared and common history with one single parliament. And the building that today uh, graces our Union Parliament was, of course, built in the middle of the 19th century following the dreadful fire in 1834, which burned down the old English Parliament. And whilst it was very sad that it burned down, it did have an advantage that the English Parliament had grown up like many institutions piecemeal with bits added here and there. It wasn't big enough to hold the 100 Irish MPs as well as all the English, Scottish and Welsh MPs and so uh, whilst they wouldn't have designed it that way, uh, in most cases the fact that they could build a new building enabled them to build something much bigger. And the palace we see today is the Victorian view of the new union. It celebrates the four countries equally in the great central crossing of central lobby with the symbols and saints and achievements of the four countries of the union. And throughout the palace, you see the pride and the coming together of these four countries with difficult histories uh, between each other uh, in this uh, union for 120 years. Uh, we then know that beginning of the 20th century, uh, Catholic Irish people felt that it could no longer in any way speak for them, and after a lot of bitterness, a new settlement was reached with the creation of the Irish Free State. And by the time we get to, say, 1928, to take a very important date in my story, the date when uh, all women over 21 finally get the vote, we have a massive overseas empire. 
Uh, we have a largely united kingdom which has sorted out its biggest problem, which was the problem of Catholic Ireland by agreeing to creation of a friendly state uh, in the, the south and west of the island of Ireland, uh, called then the Irish Free State. And we have completed our democratic progress from the 40 shilling freeholders of the late medieval period through the 1832 Great Reform Bill to start to broaden the franchise through the later Victorian extensions of the franchise to, uh, to men of less wealthy means than had previously been the franchise uh, through to the great enfranchisement of 1918 when all men over 21 are finally given the vote as a thank you for the war and all women uh, of a certain age and a certain wealth are at last given the vote en route to 1928 when the suffragette vision finally uh, is there in all its glory. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is our story of a united kingdom. And what is curious is that as someone born into uh, English and British and United Kingdom life in the second half of the last century, and brought up on this story of democracy and freedom and justice and the contributions England and then Britain and then the United Kingdom had made to the world with all of this, I thought I lived in a settled country. And I think we all took pride in our constitutional settlement. We saw other countries struggling over identity and freedom and votes and borders. And we thought, well, at least we know who we are and what we're doing. We've, we are a united island. Uh, we are united with part of Ireland wishes to be part of us, and so, so it will rest. We have a universal franchise, we have justice under the law. And I've now discovered in my political life that it has fallen to the current generation to preside over a reopening of all these mighty issues that I and many like me fondly thought had been resolved for, usually for the better, by our predecessors, sparing us the task. And two main things have reopened all these colossal issues for the United Kingdom. The first, biggest by far, is our membership of the European Union, which has started to challenge that structure of authority and accountability, which we had fought over and laid down so carefully and patiently over the centuries so that we could always say that if you paid tax, you elected the people who voted the taxes and they were accountable to you. And that has started to fray because we now have lawmakers and even tax spenders, and in the case of the OT, tax raisers and imposers uh, that we do not directly elect through our Westminster Parliament. And the European Union is struggling desperately for democratic accountability and legitimacy and is greatly complicating uh, our freedoms and our story. And then there is the second big issue which has arisen, and that is this issue of how do we settle the government of the four different parts of the United Kingdom. And I think Labour's lopsided devolution in some ways made it worse rather than better. I think there was an issue there. I think we needed to listen and respond. Uh, but I think the, the settlement wasn't sufficient to deal with all the concerns of Scottish nationalists, whereas it's in danger of becoming too big a settlement to allow England uh, to have none of the same advantages. And so it's beginning to become a pressure both ways. The pressure so far has been much bigger in Scotland, uh, where a very successful Scottish nationalist party, locally and electorally, uh, has done what many thought particularly in Labour thought, was impossible. They have won a majority in a proportional representation system in the Scottish Parliament, and they're using that platform to try and further the aim of independence or much, much more self-government within the confines of the United Kingdom. But there are also signs now, um, not yet too worrying, but there are signs of a growing English consciousness uh, by the English electors. And England is very often Thank heavens it is a very tolerant country, a country that accepts things for a long time, that would rather sort it out by argument and discussion, and is very prepared to compromise. But if you push England too far, 
Uh, if you go too far in giving England a very bad deal, then there will be a very strong political reaction uh, to that, and I wish us to avoid that happening, which is why I'm, again, this evening making some contribution to this debate about how we need to take the problem of England seriously as we think about resettling uh, our country. A union uh, can work well only if most people in the union accept its legitimacy and think it is broadly in their interests. And we are seeing the, the proposition of what makes for a good union tested almost to destruction on the continent uh, with the terrible experiences many countries are facing uh, through their premature decision to go into a currency union with their neighbours. I spent quite a bit of my 90s in, in British politics urging this country, first and foremost, not to join the Euro. And I'm glad that with many of you and others outside this room we were successful. Uh, we persuaded the Conservative Party quite early on. Uh, we then eventually persuaded the Labour Party, which turned out to be very important because they were in government for quite a long time when these important events were happening. But I think above all, we created an intellectual climate which made it impossible for Labour to think of going ahead with the Euro without a vote. And when they saw the polling, we created a climate which told them they were very unlikely ever to win that vote because the British people were more sensible than some of their politicians and recognised that a premature currency union uh, could not possibly work and would have to lead on either to its breakup or to full political union. Union of currencies requires unions of sovereigns. I used to go around saying, I don't know about you, I like my neighbours a lot, I'm quite happy to have drinks with them at Christmas or go to their summer barbecue if invited, but I'm not yet ready to share my bank account with them. I just feel it could get a bit tense at times, I might feel I'd put some money in and they'd already spent it when I wanted to spend it, and you needed to have rules over that kind of thing, which is why you don't tend to have a bank account with the neighbours, however well you get on with them. And it seemed to me it was the fairest analogy for, for the euro. And my critics kept on trying to find ways of exposing that this was an imperfect analogy, but it was difficult for them, and I was delighted they tried, because it gave the analogy more circulation. The rebuttal of uh, truths or heresies is often the way that they, they get purchase as the media will tell you. So they helped me get that case across. And as I've watched the, the history unfold of the euro, I think perhaps I wasn't strong enough. It is exactly the issue that was at stake. Uh, that in order to make the euro a success, the, the rich countries with big surpluses, particularly Germany, have to be prepared to share their money with the poorer areas in the way that within the sterling currency union, we share our money around. There are large transfers going on all the time. Uh, obviously, we make transfers through the block grant to local authorities who have variable degrees of funding per head, depending on need. We make very variable transfers to pay universal benefits at universal agreed rates, so that if one part of the country has a lot of unemployed people, they get uh, an income based on averages around the country, paid for by other parts of the country if necessary. Uh, we have transfers through working tax credits and so forth. We have all sorts of mechanisms for routing money to local government, to devolved government, and through welfare to individuals, which they simply do not have in the Eurozone, which is why it's proving so difficult. And it's why I think Alistair Darling and others have been absolutely correct to stress the currency argument in the current debate over Scotland's future. So the position is very simple for Scotland. Uh, if someone genuinely is a Scottish nationalist, and I, I can understand that, I can understand that it could be very strongly held for you, surely they'd want to be properly independent. To be properly independent, you need your own currency. You cannot have an economic policy, a fiscal policy, uh, a policy which makes sense if you are sharing a currency with the neighbours. And so it's in Scotland's independent interest she wants to be truly independent, to have her own currency. And I think the fact that 
uh, the main advocates of Scottish independence don't want their own currency tells you that they aren't serious about independence because they, they don't really want independence. They, they wish to be uh, fully paid up members of the European Union and they wish to have uh, a currency operated by the Bank of England. The clue is in the name. So I think um, it, it is a, it's a very curious debate which shows us that there's still business to be thought through on sorting out the degree of union. So, my, my conclusions are these, that my country, country of many of you, our England, has made a crucial contribution to the development of freedom and liberty in the world. It proudly has put its name on those important concepts of freedom under the law, equal treatment under the law, and representative democracy. It fathered and mothered the idea of no taxation without representation, although its fine, finest advocates turned out, ironically, uh, to be in our American colony, who had learned our lesson only too well, uh, free-born Englishmen as they were originally. Uh, and they showed us how to do it because we hadn't followed our own principles and our own logic in their case. Our country uh, has been a very important engine and architect of union, uh, with our nearest and dearest neighbours, the Welsh, the Scots, and uh, today some of the Irish, and they are all very welcome to stay with us, and, and most of us are unionists and welcome the union and wish it well. But because we are Democrats, it has to be a free and voluntary association. And because we are Democrats, if the Scots tell us it no longer suits them, of course they should have a vote on it, as they are now having, and may we live on either side by the result, whether we like it or not. It has to be a democratic choice made democratically. I think they will decide to stay in the union, and we then need to rebalance our union. Tonight is not the time to give you the second lecture on how we sort out the European Union and the very big and sometimes damaging impact that is having on the conduct of our democracy, representative government and taxation in this country. I wish to confine my remarks to an equally large and very important question in many ways, which is how we have fairness within our country, whatever our new arrangement with Europe may be, uh, so that England can feel that she has a voice and she has justice, just as Scotland rightly deserves a voice and justice. So my solution is that we have to have uh, no representation without taxation, but we do need to have English votes and English debates on English issues in Parliament. Being someone who thinks we have too many politicians already, I do not favour a new building and a new set of parliamentarians for an English Parliament. I think the English Parliament is at Westminster and always has been, uh, well, not always, but has been for a good 500 years, uh, and that's good enough for me, as well as the Union Parliament being at Westminster and has been uh, in the way that I have described as the union has built up. I think it should be possible for I and my colleagues representing English seats to do both jobs so that we can be economical with your money but attentive to your interests. And so my simple proposal is just that. That if elected uh, to the union parliament as an English member of parliament, we do as English MPs what the Scottish members of the Scottish Parliament choose to do through a separate set of politicians elected to a different body. What is fair for Scotland is fair for England. Lopsided devolution becomes equal-sided devolution. English people restore their accountability over their representatives. And above all, that fundamental principle of liberty that you should have direct access and control over your representatives who impose taxes on you would be, once again, properly upheld. Very happy to take your points and questions.